I'm Liz hirschnoff tolly and welcome to the Capital Coffee Connection podcast. And the reason for this podcast is to really get to know our elected leaders for who they are as people, get to know their heart, their humanity, the homes they come from, the hopes they have, and we really stay away from politics and policy. But the beauty is that these are elected leaders. So we have beautiful conversations. And today I'm super excited because I get to speak with Congresswoman Haley Stevens, who is from Michigan. She represents Michigan's 11th district. She is a powerhouse, a very special person, and I'm really excited for people to get to know her. And so thank you, Haley, for joining me. It's a delight to have you at my office. Well, thank you. And we are in your office, so I just wanted to point out for those who see it that we are in uh, Haley Stevens' office here in the Capitol. And so if the phone rings, you'll know that this is really a work-in office. <laughs> right. It might ring. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, like, I've always, like, trying to figure out a way to introduce people. And one of the things I know about you is that you're passionate. You know, you don't hide your feelings and you really put yourself in there for what you believe in. And I think that's what we want all of our elected leaders to do. And the part I also love is that while you are passionate, you are also really good at working with people that have a different opinion. So you have been somebody that has worked in a bipartisan manner to do a lot of things. And I think that that's a message that gets lost in our country. And that isn't about the actual policy or the politics, but that is really just about how do we get stuff done? And that's why you're here. That is what I think about when I look at you right now. And I think like who you are as a person and as a leader. So I want to say thank you. Something's working. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. One question, which is just to talk a little bit about your district in Michigan, like where you come from, who the people are, and why your district is the best one. <laughs> I really do have the best district. That's uh, what my team says all the time. But I'm from a part of Michigan that we call Metro Detroit. To a national audience, it might be better explained as the suburbs of Detroit, but we really see ourselves as a metro area. Uh, I represent exclusively Oakland County, so I call myself Oakland County's Congresswoman, and this is home to some incredibly hardworking Americans, engineers, auto designers, creatives, artists, healthcare workers. We've got some very dense suburbs that are in uh, dense neighborhoods that are in this district. And they're very fun downtowns, cute downtowns, lots of creativity seeding through them, and a direct proximity to Detroit, mm -hmm. which is in a moment of renaissance. And there's also, with that, incredible diversity. We just have growing diversity in, in the district. And then in terms of enterprises, I do cover and I do have in my district a very robust automotive supply chain. I have uh, what's now called Stellantis. That's Chrysler headquartered in my district. So I have one of our original equipment manufacturers located in Auburn Hills, which also has a bunch of mid-sized suppliers and even some smaller ones. And why that's important to mention, Liz, is that that is the hub of innovation. It is seething through the district and the place that I call home. This is the moonshot of our energy transition and uh, electric vehicle revolution, in addition to things that are taking place on hydrogen. A lot of the legislation that we passed in the first part of President Biden's term are coming to fruition in the place that I call home. If this is batteries, if this is infrastructure spend, if this is modernizing our pipes. So it's a really exciting time to be in Michigan. Detroit's at its lowest levels of unemployment in 50 years. We just reopened Grand Central Station in downtown Detroit to an amazing concert and lots of fanfare and tying that to entrepreneurship. And so, as we like to say, don't bet against the United States of America, but don't bet against Michigan. Don't bet against Oakland County. We're doing some amazing things. It's great. See, passion. I passion, see a little baby. passion, but it's all based on things that are happening. So thank yeah. you. And then also, I'd just like to talk a little bit about working across the aisle, because you and I have talked about your work as the co-chair of the Congressional Task Force on American Hostages and Americans Wrongfully Detained Abroad. And you work with Representative French Hill. And this is a really hard area because these are people, and I know you have somebody from your district, from your area, who has been hostage for a long time. And I, I think this is just an important for the Americans, people to understand kind of what goes on. 
And in a way to understand how you're able to work with Representative Hill and have these conversations to help Americans. Yeah. And this is this is another area of deep passion. And the work on hostages and Americans wrongfully detained abroad has probably been some of the most grueling and difficult things I have worked on since I've been in Congress. It can be moments of great hope and inspiration, and it can be some very painful moments alongside innocent people, families who didn't sign up for this, who are absolutely amazing, but in deep pain. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing them in those tough moments. And you're also, as an elected official, in a place where you really have to remind people what is going on with hostages around the world. You mentioned my constituent, Paul Whelan. He's been wrongfully detained in Russia, illegally in prison. We see Evan Gershkowitz, the Wall Street Journal reporter, going through the same trial, same charge as as Paul. And I'm holding my breath on that. Uh And I know what road he's on with that sham trial and the false charges and, you know, Putin's lawlessness. The comparison is that we are also in the middle of a very painful and ongoing hostage crisis in Gaza with citizens of Israel and of the world, uh, 24 nations, who were taken on October 7th, free and fair citizens, stripped from their beds, taken at a concert, doing their job. And unlike with a state actor, even one as tough and brutal as Russia, Paul Whelan, Evan Gershwitz, they still have counselor access. We still have some form of diplomacy. In Gaza, what we have is rogue terrorist jihad organization that's a non-state actor. So there's no diplomacy. So it's a really dark and tough road. And I know we're not here on this podcast to totally get into policy, but it's important to set the context because this is about humanity. And when I came into Congress... I realized it feels really good to say the word bipartisan. It's a, it feels really good to say we need to get along and we need to link arms and we need to come together for the good of the country. That doesn't even begin to cover it. What we need to do is find the things that are inherently bipartisan, that inherently unite people, and work on those and bring those issues to the forefront. And from the day I was sworn in, Paul Whelan was wrongfully detained. And from the, from that first day to this day, I have only had bipartisan unity. This has covered two presidential administrations. Obviously, sometimes there's criticisms or frustrations. But when we pass the resolution calling for the release of Paul, it's bipartisan. When I'm working with French Hill, we're working together, yes, as I'm a member of Congress from Michigan, he's a member of Congress from Arkansas, we're two different parties, but we are Americans. And we are shining a light on what it means to be in a democracy, to have free and fair citizens of all ages, as you well know, Liz, taken from us. And again, the resolution that Paul Whelan, or not Paul Whelan, but it was based off of Paul Whelan, the resolution that French Hill and I put forward condemning Hamas, calling for the release of the hostages, was voted on 414 to zero meaning every single member of Congress present that day voted for that resolution. Now, there has been lots of votes this term in Congress, but I know that that vote, that unanimous vote, was such a unifier for us on a tough subject that's brought out a lot of, you know, emotions in people, but everyone was able to say, no, we can't allow free citizens to be taken anywhere from their homes, world. anywhere world. in the world, anywhere in the world. And so that's, you know, absolutely a part of that work and that charge. And I feel so blessed to work with French Hill and his team. We we really do feel very connected uh, as operations on this. Uh, we feel blessed to do this work, honored to know so many of these families, these incredible families, who not just uh, in, in you know have loved ones uh, wrongfully held in Gaza, but but across the world, and we're not going to stop, and we're going to use. We passed legislation right. th- in addition to the resolutions that has been bipartisan, and we're going to keep going. And it's not just on that subject either, Liz. You know, 
Manufacturing continues to be very bipartisan. You know, I look at this, I'm in the minority party. I've had six bills pass the House this term. I mean, hey, that's, um, we're doing okay. Yeah. Some have been on hostages, which have been, you know, which has been important. And I want people to know that because people need to hear it. And a lot of times, you know, or. i just like to add in there, which is, you said for 24 nations, but there are eight Americans. Eight Americans. And I yeah. always think about like how the Americans public does not understand there are eight Americans being held. And I also, you know, there's 120 people still being held. And it is, like you said, it's a humanitarian crisis. And I am grateful for the work you did because, and you continue to do because, as you know, my great niece was a hostage. I have experienced this and I see what these families are going through. And the fact that the leadership of this country is united for it, it does not necessarily bring home these hostages today, but it is something that gives some comfort and appreciation for what our government can do when they work together. And I'll just lastly say that at President Biden's State of the Union, the one time that there were two times they stood up, the Republicans and the Democrats together, and one of those times was for the hostages. So that is shows that what we can do when we come together. Yeah. And we're bringing leadership to it. Yes. And that's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. I'm talking about leadership, your mom, your family growing up. We're going to make a quick oh. transition because I also want to get people to know yeah. who you are. And, sure. and I know you and your mom share a very special relationship. Yeah. And I would love just to hear and share with people a little bit about growing up mm -hmm. uh, in Michigan and what family life was like and your mom and just share with us. Well, I was incredibly fortunate to have strong women in my life who really showed me I could do anything I wanted. My mom, when I was in an early elementary school, went into business with her sister. They were in advertising, public relations. They really had a lot of fun, but also some success, which was great to see. I remember they took me to a meeting when I was in fifth grade called What's a Website? You know, or how to use a website for your business. You just aged yourself. Okay, yeah, keep going. Something like yeah, that, yeah. right? Well, hey, you know, uh, take it as you can. But but I, I had a lot of that exposure. I remember when I told my aunt that I was running for Congress, she said, oh, I've been waiting for this. Like, I've been waiting for you to put your hand up. And then I remember I, I told my mother first, of course, and and I wrote my mom, you know, like a, a, a business email about it. Like, here's the plan. You know, this is what I'm thinking and my mom's always really good on email, and she was actually in her last year of work before, like, official retirement, but she was still working at that time, and so I had, I'd sent her this note. She didn't respond. I'm thinking, she always responds. Mom always responds. So we we had, uh, had a lunch date, and, and we were talking, and she said, you know, Haley, when you sent me that note, I've just been so on the floor since this election because my mother and, and my aunt, but my mom in particular, really fought for women's rights in the 60s and in the 70s and was a trailblazer in her own right. A very industrious woman, woodcarver, painter, phenomenal oil painter. And these are all hobbies, like still wood carves. Like mom has a bandsaw. You know, mom worked in business. My, mom wasn't afraid to stand up for her rights or stand up to speak truth to power and things along those lines. So she, so she kind of reflected a little bit in that moment. Like, I, you know, I've been kind of on the floor following from the 2016 election. You sent me this email. It's given me hope, right? It's given me hope. And so my mom has also just been my biggest champion as I've run for office. You know, we run every other year. She's a precinct delegate. She's really involved in the activities. But you asked about growing up. And, you know, I grew up in a household with really hardworking parents. And I'll never forget on my dad's side, my my other aunt, who was also a local elected official, again, surrounded by strong women. I had called her and told her I was running for Congress. And she said, you know, I never thought anyone in our family would run for Congress or be able to run for Congress because it always seemed like, you know, it had to kind of come from legacy or you had right. to be, you know, a, a, a man or something along those lines. And but again, I was just always showed I could do whatever I wanted. And my personality was really nurtured. So, you know, I wanted to plan a neighborhood event and my mom just let me plan it. And, you know, she, she'd let me experiment and, you know, succeed or fail. And my dad would say that to me. He's like, you know, people who never fail don't always know how to succeed. So my parents really nurtured me. And I was born in Rochester Hills, Michigan, which is the hometown of Madonna. 
All right. And Madonna's mother, Joan Saccone, this is all on those, you know, VH1 specials and all that, but not about me, but just Madonna's growing up. She had a daycare center and I went to that daycare center. No way. Uh, yes way. And, 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 you know, I'm really proud of being from Rochester Hills, Michigan. Yeah. And I'm really proud of my parents' story because they met at Oakland University. They also started a business together. Oakland University is a um, mid-sized college in uh, um, Oakland County, Michigan. It's run by a woman named Ora Peskovitz, Liz, who I'd love to introduce you to, actually. I've written some op-eds with her and done some really great work with her on issues that I know you care about. But when my parents moved to Rochester Hills, it was rural. I mean, it was a small town. Right. My mom remembers sledding down what is now a main road. And so they were really a part of Rochester and Rochester Hills kind of growth and coming age. They were involved in art festivals and craftsmanship and just partnership with some of the small businesses in the community. And then when I was in middle school, my parents got divorced. I have great relationship with both of them. My mom moved to Birmingham right around the corner from her sister. They still live right around the corner from each other. I now live the corner over from the two of them. So we say we're like a little Italian village, but that moving it, 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 when I was younger was also really transformative right. because I collected all these friends and I went to three schools in three years. And for me, it was like, well, this is just a gift because I met all these people who, you know, fast forward many years later, uh, you know, were part of my election or part of my campaign and yeah. part of this community that we've built. And, you know, I, I really gathered an understanding of this broader place that I now call call home. So I, I think that's great. And I also wonder, because I've asked a lot of leaders about teachers, did you, because your mom, like your childhood sounds exciting and wonderful, like like stimulating, even though it was moving around and your parents got divorced, but you still like, you just, you can hear there's a lot of love in it. But did you have teachers or a specific teacher that you can look back and you would think, wow, that teacher was really special? You know, I went to Latchkey after school. And the people who ran Latchkey were like kind of like our second family. Mm -hmm. And I think as a kid, it's really interesting to ask yourself about how you form family outside of your own family. Uh, that was in my neighborhood. That was at Latchkey. Those were the friendships. There was a woman named June who ran Latchkey for us, who was really special uh, to me, and in part because she was kind of tough, but she was also there for us. And she also let us play around and not always do our homework, but, uh, you know, play Mad Libs or something and, you know, experiment with fun words and Mad Libs. And then another really transformative figurehead for me were uh, Brenda and Lawrence Cohn, uh, who owned my summer camp mm. that I went to for 10 years. And that's where I formed another family. And that's where I also spread my wings and my creativity and, and things along those lines. So I've had a lot of mentors. I guess also, since we're talking about teachers, my last one who I wanted to share was my health teacher in college, or not in college, in high school, my Dr. Fleming. And she was just this brilliant woman who saw me as me. And nurtured me. Uh, that was I was on my third school at that point. I was a little different. I had a big personality. And I, I'll never forget, I asked her to write my one of my college recommendation letters, and, and she did so. And we just kept up over the years. And she was also not afraid to move the needle, too. And it's a special environment to be in. It's very important. It's it really, really is. And I think the concept of teachers seeing students at a time when students really are vulnerable and they need to be seen and to be nurtured is is beautiful. Yeah. Because we're a little bit short on time, the one thing I'm going to jump to now, because I could talk to you forever. We'll do and, this again. Yeah, we'll keep know. talking. Next but, time I'll lay down on the couch. It's like therapy session. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But one question that I've asked everyone, which I'd love to ask you, is best advice you've ever received, worst advice you've ever received? Oh, expect best intentions. That's best advice. My mom shared that with me a long time ago. And she's no Pollyanna. You know, she's right. no Patsy. But it, it's this idea of, like, you never know what's going on with somebody. And sometimes, like, you think they're getting in your way or, you know, you think they're mad at you. But really, they've got all this stuff going on in their head or in their life. And, you know, it, it, it's about how to form trust with yep. people. Some of the worst advice I, I have probably gotten 
has kind of been about like looking in the past and in some ways, right? And just if like you only live once or, you know, this is as good as it gets. And 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 you'd be surprised. People say that. I mean, I, I remember, you know, wistful moms uh, of my friends, you know, when we were turning 21, like these are your glory years. I'm like, well, thank goodness 21 wasn't my glory years. <laughs> my dad also has a good piece of advice, which is it. Uh, to counter that, which is it just keeps getting better and better. I love that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these are my rapid questions and get okay, ready. Get ready. This is everybody gets to learn a little bit more about Haley Stevens. What is your favorite sound? Oh my gosh. I love the, um, the dong, you know, like the peaceful, like the oh, Buddhist the dong. Hits. Yes. I, I love that. And my friend actually has a really good way to capture that sound and i've been hinting to ask her how to get it in my life yeah okay favorite color blue favorite smell or scent i i love flowery perfumes i really do i'm a flowery perfume girl okay and we already my other question which i've already answered is who's your biggest cheerleader and i know it's your mom yeah it is mom <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> favorite ice cream flavor mint chocolate chip okay you, you know your favorite chocolate egg, your yeah. favorite ice cream. <laughs> and if you were going to pick a favorite one meal, you had one meal to choose, what would be the ideal meal? Sushi. And got to get that protein, Liz. Oh, yeah. You got to get yeah. you got to get that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I mean, I'm a big sushi fan, so I appreciate that. <laughs> we got to have sushi together someday. Yeah. Oh, we lo I look forward to that. Me too. Do you have time to exercise besides running around the halls of uh, the Capitol? I don't live if I don't exercise. I love to exercise. What is your exercise? You know, it's changed as I've grown up a little bit, right? I still get in my cardio. I used to be a sprinter and a speed runner, but now I'm more of like a hiker and a biker oh, nice. and, and things like that. But you know you're not living if you're not doing strength training. So I I really incorporate strength training. I learned that because I broke my ankle running a half marathon because I hadn't built up my glute muscles. You know, it's like a lifetime of running and you're not doing any strength. And so I, I learned to adopt that and I really make time for it Good. because I know I'm not my best if, if I don't. Yeah. And do you listen to music when you work out? I try to. I get the classic rock going, you know, a little Bob Seger, Michigan's hometown son, something like that. Good, good, good. Favorite household chore? Oh gosh. I, I really like cleaning my kitchen. Like I love a clean countertop. You know, and it's also kind of easy to clean your kitchen sometimes. But if I can organize my closet, that's a good day, too. Okay. <laughs> if you have time. If I have yeah. time, I know. And what is Haley Stevens' superpower? Oh, boy. Well, if you would have asked the, me 20 years ago, it would have probably been that I don't sleep very much. But I've learned that lesson, and that's not really a superpower or healthy. But I just love people. I love people. I love meeting people and I love learning. And I think the the day you stop learning is, you know, the again, the day you stop living. Where in the world have you dreamed to travel and not yet made it? Well, my mom and I decided we want to go to India. Okay. <laughs> so that's that's on the list. We'll let you know if we make it happen. <laughs> well, I think you should try. Yeah. At some point. I was like, like, never been to India. Yeah. That's not, it's right. probably not happening before November. But I think it's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be really special. Okay. So my last question that I've asked everyone, which I love, what is your definition of joy? What brings you joy? Could be work, private. And then how do you share your joy with others? I really got this from my parents who both love nature. They know every kind of tree. And it is spending time outside and particularly being outside with others. So, you know, look, I'm on a lot of planes. I'm in a lot of office buildings here in the Capitol, long days, committee hearings, votes. It's really inspiring uh, to be in the nation's capital. But there's nothing that brings me more joy than experiencing nature and experiencing it with family or a friend. That's beautiful. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you. And, you know, I was thinking about there's a lot of peas here today. And I'm going to say, like, that you are full of purpose, full of passion. You love people and you have purpose. And, like, I was just thinking, like, as we were talking, like, that's really who you are. And I just want to say thank you because I, I also think about young people that look and see this woman who has, they could be that same person. Absolutely. His life wasn't necessarily meant to be in the political world, mm -hmm. traveled, went to different schools, had different experiences. And one day he woke up and said, you know what? I'm going to do something. I want to make a difference. Make a difference. So thank you. Thank you for your time. It's been an honor to have you in my office and spend some 
at Opportunities Exchanging. Love it. Hi, it's Liz. Please join me every Tuesday for coffee to talk about heart and humanity with our elected leaders. Remember to hit subscribe to get an alert when a new episode is live and for exclusive content. Ciao.